Uh, we are uh, delighted to to, uh, uh, to have you with us uh, this morning. Um, we uh, are very excited to talk about how the brain works in this storytelling process. After having been talking about you know more ancient visions of, of how story work, um, and uh, the first question we would like to ask you with my friend uh, Atik is. Um, to, to show you, to show us the, uh, the elements you had to, 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 to show us as an intro um, in order to give us the, the type of tools with which you're working. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Antoine. The pleasure is very much on my side here and I feel really grateful that I, that I have this opportunity to talk to you because this is really, I, I, I hope that we can start this dialogue and that it can grow. So I'm going to give you a very brief overview of the work I do just to provide some context. I'm currently um, in the Department of Communication at Michigan State University and um, the reason for this is that um, communication is kind of the home discipline of media psychology. And we have one of the largest um, concentration in the world of media psychologists. And this is also where the emerging discipline of media neuroscience is based. So as you know, stories, they create very rich worlds in the mind. And because as we as cognitive neuroscientists say, the mind is what the brain does. Therefore, it makes sense um, to examine how the brain responds when it is exposed to stories. So the way I do this is that we put people into this um, brain scanner machine and we expose them to stories while they are lying inside of this kind of donut shaped magnet called an fMRI or functional magnetic resonance imaging scanner. And while they are inside, we broadcast stories either in with, via a screen in front of their eyes or they can also listen to audiobooks or other narratives and then we can scan their brain activity over time on a moment to moment basis and simultaneously from multiple sides of the brain so this is one methodology that i use in order to measure how the brain responds to stories so this was fMRI or functional magnetic resonance imaging. Another method that is in use increasingly is EEG or electroencephalography. This works um, by putting little sensors on the top of your skull and then recording very fast electrical signals. So these are two methods. I'm going to mainly focus on fMRI for now. Now, one kind of perspective I hope to provide here is because I'm based in the Department of Communication to view stories as a means of mass communication. That is mass communication, we say, is a one to many form of communication activities. What I mean by that is that the story that we consume is more or less, at, at least at the beginning where it starts with a printed word or with a, with a, uh, with a pictures on screen, it's the very same same information for everyone. So the information that hits your eye, your retina or your ear and then get, enters the brain, this information is initially the same for everybody. So when you sit in a cinema, movie theater and you sit next to a person, it's basically the same physical information that hits your eyes and ears. Um, so this is this notion of mass communication. And so I'm really interested in, in what stories elicit commonly across, across different people. That's what, I, what I'm interested in. And the way we do this on the side of the analysis is using a method called intersubject correlation analysis that was pioneered by a neuroscientist named Uri Hasson, um, who did a very kind of moonshot study in 2004 that was published in Science. And then I contacted him, got to work with him, and that has um, led to me working in this area of media neuroscience since. So how this method works is if people are exposed to a movie, which is kind of a sequence of images and sound over time, 
this movie is super, super complex. And in fact, historically, neuroscientists thought this would be too complex to even to even study. However, because of this idea that the movie is essentially the same for everybody, um, this allows us to do a pretty interesting analysis that I believe is deeply meaningful and hope that we can talk about this. So for example, what we can do is, is we can measure via fMRI how this movie is processed over time. So what you see here is from one part of the brain. Let me tell you, this is in the visual cortex, which responds to visual properties of the, of the movie. We can extract the activity and we can see this is the x-axis would be time and the y-axis would be signal strength. So more or less, you can think about it as activity, higher and lower over time. And as you can see, this is a complex time course. And it's difficult to relate that time to what is shown in the movie at this moment. But what we can do is, because the movie is the same movie for everyone, essentially, we can go to a fellow's brain and go to the same so to speak, coordinates, the kind of the same spot in the brain. And we can also extract that signal from the part of the brain here. And we can then superimpose the red and the green signal. And as you can see, they look pretty similar. And in a way, this is not so surprising because, well, the visual cortex, the visual parts of the brain, they need to do visual analysis. So if you show them the same movie, then they need to do similar work, right? So. Here we see what we call a correlation, similar or shared or collectively shared neural activity in this visual processing region. What we can then do is we can march through the entire brain on a region by region basis. And we can always ask for every pair of corresponding regions, how similar the movie makes them tick, so to speak. And as you can see, we also get a similar region, a similar signal here. Now, the important thing is that these higher order regions, they no longer respond only to the physical properties of the stimulus, but they start to become responsive to things that have to do with the emergence of meaning and comprehension and tuning into the movie, which I hope we can talk more about. And we can then basically map out regions of the brain that respond in a similar way across different people. And we can do this analysis not only for two, of course, but we can do it for entire audiences of five, 10, 500 people and so on. So by that way, we can kind of map out regions of the uh, brain that show this shared processing that as, the, as multiple brains kind of tune in to this movie. So this is kind of the concept figure that, that summarizes this all, right? So the movie, is the same for everybody and it casts a signal onto different brains which then start to tick collectively and we do this this kind of audience response measurement analysis we do this with all kinds of media stimuli we do it with movies with public service announcements about health we can do it with newspaper articles that you present in a teleprompter style or we can also do it with speeches so this is a cool tool to measure from the from a, from a perspective of brain activity how a mediated stimulus or a narrative um, kind of draws the audience in. To give you a little bit of an example of how I do this, um, one study that I am very interested in is, or one phenomenon that I'm really interested in is suspense. Now, you as screenwriters, you know this um, much better than I do. Suspense is kind of one of the most, perhaps one of the most powerful phenomena that can be evoked by movies that makes people collectively come to the edge of their seat and sweat and so on. And Hitchcock, the master of suspense, knew this particularly well, how to elicit suspense. So what he did is he gave the audience information that the characters themselves who were depicted in the movies lack. Um, so. For example, one, one way that he did this is with a little um, movie called Bang Bang and You Are Dead. It's a short narrative depicting a young boy who finds a gun, loads a gun with a bullet, and then walks around town aiming that gun at people. So you as the audience know that this is a real gun and not a toy gun. And you know that he is aiming this at, for example, his mother. And you know that if he pulls the trigger and the shot goes off, the mother might be dead. But the characters in the movie, they don't know this. So this creates this kind of disconnect that um, elicits 
kind of suspense, kind of like these springs illustrated here. And this is a collective phenomenon because many people report really the same feelings over time when you ask them. So I was fortunate that I had access to a large data set of 600 people whose brains had been scanned in Cambridge um, while they were exposed to this little short movie. We rarely have the opportunity to have such big data, 600 brains. This is really um, kind of a very valuable data set. So we have a large audience. Um, and I'm just going to show you how these data look like when we do this analysis that I showed you of signal activity over time. So to the left, you see a brain kind of averaging, averaging the activity from 100 viewers. And to the right, you will see another 100 viewers. So these are two independent audiences, and I'm just going to play it here. As you can see, the movie is sped up a little, so it's faster than it is originally. So I'm going to show you show it to you again. It's only a kind of a segment of the movie. And it's an old cheesy movie for sure, but you get the idea. Now I would like to focus your attention to the brains on the lower part of the image as I'm playing this again. What you can see here now is that they, to the left and to the right, almost mirror each, each other in terms of the signal. So red means just more or less more activity and blue le means less activity. But what you can see here is that these movies, the kind of, they make the brains of these audiences of 200 people left or 100 left and right kind of fluctuate in a similar way. So the spatiotemporal activity patterns that are evoked across the brain, they resemble each other across audiences. And we could show this movie to another 600 people and we would get a very similar, similar result. So why do these brains tick similarly? That is the question. So, so as one say, I, I already said it, it's not so surprising that visual regions of the brain do similar things, right? However, the, the real, the, the thing starts to get interesting when people start to have similar thoughts, similar feelings that are trans, that are kind of offered to them by the screenwriters who try to control more or less, that's what they do, um, um, to control what, what the audience is thinking and feeling. So in this way, kind of, I, I, I Metaphorically, I say that a director is kind of like like a DJ, but a BJ, right? It's like a brain jockey in a way. So they, they can orchestrate like a conductor, direct audience responses. So to when we do this with our movie here, we can, for example, this movie has a little bit of sound, which I haven't shown you here, but we could look into auditory areas of the brain and we would see how they respond similarly. And we could also go into higher order regions of the brain and map out how this movie draws the audience in. Now, one, one little sophistication, and then I'm basically done, is what we also want to do, rather than looking at how the entire movie makes audiences tick similarly, we want to see whether this effect, whether this fluctuates over time. So we can do the same analysis by moving a little window over different parts of the movie in order to see whether the collective grip that the movie has on the audience as a whole, whether that varies over time. So the idea here is that if something boring happens and the, there is kind of, people can think idiosyncratically whatever they think, and then their brains would be pretty different. However, if something happens that kind of orchestrates the audience, that focuses them, that takes their mind on a leash and brings them, every, makes everybody think alike, that should be reflected in a very similar brain activity. Um, so in this way, we, we kind of think of the story as a kind of almost an audience magnet. And then that should release again. So our idea is that different brain activity and brain activity should become more similarly when people become attentionally, attentionally engaged into the movie very deeply. That is the, the reasoning here. And we tested this by having an audience watch the same movie with the little boy with the gun and the bullet and just annotate the degree of suspense that people were feeling. And we could also measure other things such as how attentionally engaged they were, or we could also measure attention objectively via reaction times or other things. But so here you see whether suspense was high or low, and you see that there are kind of these boiling points of suspense, which always happen when the young boy aims the gun at somebody. And we then mapped out where in the brain 
this signal similarity called intersubject correlation analysis, where that maps onto this uh, reported suspense. And we saw that this was primarily the case in frontal regions, which we can talk about later. So to summarize, what I hope to have shown you is that movies are a form of mass communication that make many people's brains tick alike. And if we have a movie or any form of story that can organize audience brain responses. So for example, here I have another data set um, which was recorded while people read a piece of Harry Potter. So it was a chapter from a Harry Potter book that was presented to them in a kind of a teleprompter style. It's terrible from a literary standpoint, but it, it's effective in terms of making everybody receive the same information at the same moment of time. Normally, when you read books, it's a very idiosyncratic activity and it's self-paced. But here we just induce a, a external pace. And what you can see here is that here is brain activity in this auditory language related region of the brain. And here you can see it zoomed in and you see it looks pretty similar across those two brains. And down here, I am um, recording the strength of the similarity. So, for example, here it's pretty high, right? You can see that here. Or here, this moment. Now, this, I, I frankly admit, this is a little bit of cherry picking. So, this needs to be properly tested. But this part is, if you're familiar with Harry Potter, this is the part where Harry Potter um, is discovered as a seeker for the Quidditch game. So, he uh, finds out that he can ride on that broom and he goes up into the air. And it's a very engaging, very, very uh, stimulating experience for the audience. So, I'm, I'm hoping to kind of build the case more strongly that it's these moments that really bring collective attention to the boiling point and lead brains to tick more similarly. So this is basically it. I'm really delighted to be with you um, because I believe that the future is bright for stories and neuroscience. And it, the good thing is it goes both ways. On the one hand, neuroscience can provide objective tools for audience response measurement, but of course, even more so, I am really pleased to be able to talk to people who really create those movies because I've always found that they are fantastic um, intuitive psychologists who, who, who get a lot about human nature and are able to bring that into stories that then collectively resonate with millions of people worldwide. So this is it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ralph, very much. Very enlightening. enlightening. Um, so the, 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 the question, one of the core questions that we felt uh, we wanted to uh, ask you is uh, how do you characterize the, the, the takeoff uh, for the spectator, this moment of takeoff that you call deep absorption? Mm -hmm. It's yeah, that, that is a very, very complex question that I can only provide a limited answer from the perspective of neuroscience yet because I, I believe that we need to do this for about 20 years to provide a comprehensive answer. But now mechanistically it works that way that something important happens. Yeah, so for, at, in the beginning it's just physical signals that hit your eye or hit your ear. Um, but somehow, and this is more of an experience than, than something that we currently mechanistically understand, somehow this movie really achieves to, to, to pull you in very deeply. So it has to, me metaphorically, often people describe this as it, something resonates with you. And from a neurophysiological point of view, I can tell you that I believe that the uh, norepinephrinergic system, which is, for example, anchored in a deep brainstem nucleus called the locus ceruleus, plays a key role in that. However, it's not just that you can um, kind of, you can't just stick an electrode into that uh, locus ceruleus. But the really fascinating thing for me about movies is that good directors or good storytellers, screenwriters, they are able to really connect very deeply with their audience, right? So, so this is not just a phenomenon that is only triggered by, let's say, flickering lights or something. It doesn't happen in the similar way at a rock concert. But the important thing here is that these it's a form what we call semantic stimulation. So 
maybe maybe that gets us started. It's not not perfect, not a perfect answer yet. I know. But yeah. Maybe one of one of yeah. the hmm. one of the ways uh, to try to re question that from a slightly different angle would be: Is it inside the human brain that moment of t you, you were talking about the the absorption mm -hmm. with the gun, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, is it because it connects the viewer to something, mm -hmm. you know, in, mm -hmm. uh, physiologically? Mm -hmm. Is it connecting something mm -hmm. or is it mm -hmm. disconnecting something? Mm -hmm. Okay. For me, as a neuroscientist, I'm kind of a monist, right? I alluded to that by saying that the mind is what the brain does. So I, I subscribe to the fact that the mind is hosted by the brain. Sometimes people say it's the software by the brain. But there is this collective domain, dimension to it that I find deeply fascinating. This is what this whole intersubject correlation gets at. So it, it's, it spans a network across different brains so for me it's what i find so fascinating is that i'm sitting in the cinema and i'm having this deep moment where i think where a movie really strongly connects with me and um but maybe the person right next to me has exactly the same experience although it is such such a private thing to me and what you were saying in terms of connecting or disconnecting i think it's both so on the one hand, this resonance moment that we describe or this deep connection, I think that is something that where the movie evokes something in me and there is a kind of an, an ordered sequence of processes what happens in me. But very often it is the violation of expectancies, so to speak, that exactly trigger this strong attentional response. Now you can, for example, violate an expectancy by having a shot go off very quickly. But that's a pretty kind of not very sophisticated way of doing it. Um, it's more like in an action movie, right? So I, I think that although I'm not an expert on the screenwriting process, but the more skillful, more artistic things is when people lead you to believe something very deeply, and then half an hour later, they tell you, hey, you've been all wrong. And then you feel kind of fooled. And that can create a very strong response in you. Yeah. Uh, one question. Uh, you know, uh, between uh, this 600 people, that it was an experience. Mm -hmm. huh? So mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, the connecting at the same with the different generation and with different culture at the same or not? That is also a great question, which I unfortunately can't give you the final answer to yet. In psychology, there is a very old kind of uh, figure of speech saying that at some level, every person is like all others, like some others and like no other, right? So there is kind of a gradient of individuality or collectivism across us. In, in one way, we are all human beings. In one way, my individual life experience is very unique. So, um, and that's also how I think about this. If we do the analysis that I showed you, this intersubject correlation analysis, this minor, mainly focuses on the commonalities across us. Um, so for example, an old person and a young person, the basic principles of how their visual cortex or how their auditory cortex operates, those basic principles are unique across everybody. There is also this um, another figure of speech saying that everybody laughs in the same language, right? So regardless of culture, Laughter is really universal and deeply biologically rooted. So this, I would see that this is a universal response. But of course, you are very true to pointing out that there are many knowledge structures that are specific to individuals or specific to groups. And to the extent that these knowledge structures are addressed by the movie, that would predict that you can find idiosyncratic or in or group-based responses. So, for example, this old movie 
was kind of, it might trigger something like nostalgia or there might be maybe things like old telephones that were not present or that are no longer present in the, in the world that younger people live in. So possibly seeing such an old telephone might evoke different responses in older um, viewers than in younger viewers. And we have started to look into this a little bit, but currently I'm mainly focused on, on what unites us all as a group. So this is kind of my, my game is mostly to focus on the, those boiling points that are elicited across the world, uh, world audience, so to speak. But I'm, of course, keenly aware that there are big individual differences that exist between people or cultures that we, that we should focus in more. So your question is very, very spot on. And if I had the money, I would love to do very large studies to, to follow up on this. Because ultimately, if we want to, for example, explain things like conflict or that different people take away very different interpretations from the same movie, then it's no longer a kind of everybody responds the same way. But for this deep absorption, I think that can be a very universal phenomenon that is often played with by a very successful, by in any culturally successful product, more or less, whether it's religion or music or narratives. And another question, Ingemar Bergman, Swedish uh, filmmaker, mm -hmm. uh, and his movie, you know, Persona, there is one shot from one uh, woman who talks, tells a story to um, uh, camera. And just after, we listen the same story, but the camera uh, shoot the other woman who she's listening this story. The same story. And then yeah. uh, Bergman uh, said about that, the story that is lesson it was uh, is listened is not the same that what was told different different the same story but mm -hmm. you know from it's not the same comment dire ce n'est pas la même la même histoire racontée n'est pas la même qui est entendue the, the same mm. Uh, the, the same story which is told is not the same story which is understood, heard. Yes. Yep. Yep. I, I, I can only say probably he's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so of course I'm I'm simplifying the world a little when I say that um, the information that arrives at the brain is the same. That is true in terms of that the soundtrack of the story is the same, right? But what that soundtrack elicits in the listener or the speaker and so on, there can be differences. I, I, that is for sure. For example, even if the same story is listened to by two people and one person finds it interesting and another person finds it boring, that would also kind of predict in a variable attentional response in terms of how, how, how deeply people connect or absorb it. Um, there is one study that speaks to that a little bit by Uri Hassan, whom I mentioned earlier, and he did a fascinating study in which he had person talk a story, uh, like tell a story and scan their brains. This is something I have not shown, right? Um, but so you can also measure people's brain activity while they are speaking in a, in a brain scanner. It's a little technical difficult, but Let's leave that aside. But then you have their brain activity as they come up with a story. And you can then play that story to other people and measure their brain activity as they process that story. And what Uri showed was that there is similarity across people's brain activity patterns between the speaker and the listener. Now, of course, one has to qualify that and saying 
we were look or he he was looking for the similarities and one could argue that in order to make communication possible at all communication comes from the latin word communis which means shared there has to be kind of a shared basis in order to understand something however that doesn't mean that it's identical it's so shared shared means there are similarities identical means it's perfectly the same and I would definitely say that there are a lot of idiosyncratic um, interpretations and knowledge uh, and, and kind of idiosyncrasies in terms of how people can interpret stories. I think that's a very individual process. Yeah. That uh, Now again... Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Now, now again, my, my focus is mostly on kind of... For, that sounds too it sounds too coercive but my the thing that i find very interesting is that people somehow force a, a particular interpretation or you want to make it more likely yeah kind of that's okay. what i think so we we, we would have a, a, an important question here uh, the because um we believe in in a way that uh the gun culture or the idea that uh, human mm -hmm. trouble should be solved mm -hmm. uh, by guns is a cultural vision of the world that we might not share. And um, so it, it was important for us to ask you the question, how do you, if you are a storyteller mm -hmm. that wants to write script, uh, a, a, a scripts or a script generating very strong engagement, but you don't want to use the gun. <laughs> gun, yeah, yeah. What is it mm -hmm. that you are that you have at your disposal? Mm -hmm. So many things. I already said that uh, everybody laughs in the same language, except you. Like nobody would hopefully laugh if a person gets shot, right? Uh, or unless we would call that person a psychopath. Um, so um, I, I think there is a whole spectrum of human emotions and human motivations that you can um, speak to and try to address by stories. For example, one thing that I unfortunately didn't show you in the in the in the shorter moment moment uh, time. Uh, we have run a story of personal narrative, uh, run a study of personal narratives. Um, there is a very fascinating and almost forgotten radio series um, called This I Believe. So that was aired on national public radio in the 50s. And it was fascinating. It was created by somebody who thought that kind of the, the whole kind of commercial culture and gun culture and things that you allude to that they are kind of kind of almost soul sucking to people yeah and he wanted to inspire them and so he created a radio show that became hey, highly popular where people could send in their personal stories um now these were not professional writers so the stories vary widely in quality um but what we did is we took from the pool of almost 20,000 stories um we took a few of them and showed them to an audience in order to focus in on how they draw the audience collectively in if they speak to core human motives. We speak of social motivational things. So for example, humans always take naturally an interest in other humans. They, they empathize with their suffering and so on. So these are all powerful audience manipulators, if you want, right? So people are in, innate, almost innately socially curious for the fate of others and i think with with the gun you can get this response but to me it's not particularly intellectually stimulating right if you have seen 15 action movies it's always the same and so on so what i take more delight in watching are things that are a little more subtle um particularly from the independent movie scene or so um for example, I, I watched, to prepare for this, I watched Atik's uh, trailer about uh, the patient stone, I believe, or a stone of patience, or, right? Um, <laughs> and and yeah, um, that um, obviously plays, um, or, or, or so, I, I would not say place, but um, um, gets, gets very similar responses, I would argue, um, Complete. Of course, there are guns there, but they are not so central to the story, right? So that's um, so. So the answer, Antoine, is there are motivational systems 
for example, you want to care for others. That's also something that people want to do. And there are systems, there is one theory that a colleague of mine um, has done a whole um, whole work about, it's called moral foundations theory. And he calls it the MIME model, the moral model of intuitive media and morality, um, something. So, so there are many intuitive moral systems, such as care, wanting to care for others or um, respect, respecting others and so on. And you can also um, write stories around these moral uh, topics. And I think they do a similar job and even a much better one and pro-social one than the guns themselves. Um, one of the questions maybe also uh, would be um, about meaning. Uh, mm -hmm. How is it that meaning is created for us in a film, you know, as, as a viewer? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Interrupt me if I if I go off on a on a tangent yeah. for too long. Now, meaning is a difficult word for a neuroscientist, actually, because of something that we call the Leibniz gap. Back like after the German philosopher Leibniz, right? So he had this kind of almost kind of um, analogy that if you were to enter the brain and you looked you like you were to enter a mill, you know, that was in Leibniz times, there were still mills. You would be there and you would see all these um, screws and wheels turning around and you would ask, where is the meaning here, right? Or where where is the mill? So you could almost, um, and for a neuroscientist, it's very a very similar problem to communicate because while we're talking, we're talking about concepts like absorption or attention or moral. And in the brain, these concepts, they don't have immediate correspondence, right? In the brain, it's only this region doing its thing and the visual cortex and the auditory cortex and the frontal cortex and so on. Now, but what I like to propose is that there are kind of gradients of meaning by which I mean that you can think of meaning, things you can call things meaningful that may, often aren't. For example, when you see a tree, that is already something like meaning. It's, it's sensation. You would see little pieces of green and little branches and so on. And then you have perception on the next layer of meaning, meaning extraction, which is where you see this is a tree. And then you also have higher order cognitive systems where, for example, a looking at a tree might retrieve memories of your childhood, or you might think, oh, this is a tree and I could cut it down so in order to have uh, a warm fireplace in the winter and so on. So, so what I'm trying to say is that meaning in the brain is gradual and it emerges over sensory properties to perceptual properties to higher order conceptual and moral and meaning things that you would normally call meaningful. So basically anything can stimulate meaning, right? You can show people a green screen and it will stimulate the meaning of greenness. Um, now that is not a real connected story. And maybe I'll leave it with that and then we'll see where we get. <laughs> <laughs> Um, does that like did that make sense or yes it does uh, was your question targeted as somebody else some, some no 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 because it's you know it's a it's it is an issue for a screenwriter uh, mm -hmm. to of course generate meaning we're supposed to generate mm -hmm. meaning in a story but in the meantime we're supposed to also generate uh, uh, to mm -hmm. take uh, you know viewers or spectators. With us, and so it's it's mm -hmm. uh, um, it's not always completely easy for a view, for a, a writer to understand within that machinery of how can I get people on board? You know, uh, stay on my train. At what moment do I yeah. let that system of um, you know how do I captivate? But then how within that system how do I let meaning occur? How do I let that room? I, I totally get that. And I, I wished I could give you a, a, a better answer than I currently can. But it's definitely something that is super interesting to me because um, 
this takeoff moment that you were alluding to earlier and right now as well, right? So this kind of this pacing and leading and um, it's almost like a dance. When do you, when do you, or when do you, when do you shorten the leash and when do, do you relax it? This metaphorical leash that the director has on the audience with brains. It, it's difficult for me to predict this currently um, because I observe in myself that this can also be an idiosyncratic process. Um, so, for example, I can watch the same movie and depending on the background mood that I'm in and whatever the day had in for me, this can happen or it can't happen. And I totally understand the, the writer's struggle that you are not in control of these things, right? So all you can do is you are only in control of um, maximizing the chance that you get. Right, you have to play the cards that you're dealt with, so to speak, and um, you can do hopefully if this technology stuff that I presented, which is currently pretty basic science, but I think you can already see um, how this could possibly be used in order to identify moments where it could happen in an audience, right? Where we get this little uptick in where people come together as a group, where they start to resonate a little bit. And if you could find out those moments, then you could know here we can, here we're on the right track. Currently, I fear it's, um, it's more of an artistic intuition than an exact science yet. And perhaps that's for good, because otherwise we, it would lead to too much um, programming. <laughs> Manipulation <laughs> also. Yeah. 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 So I would be curious to know, uh, because of course the, the reason why you as a scientist are interested in that field um, mm -hmm. is connected to who you are as a human being and, and what you want to, mm -hmm. you know, um, push and help and contribute mm -hmm. to in terms of uh, uh, um, mm -hmm. helping, you know, humans to, uh, to understand each other maybe better, et cetera. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. So what is it that you in front of a uh, crowd of screenwriters, what is it in, in today's context, you know, uh, mm -hmm. in today's context of Uh, mm -hmm. troubled meaning and, 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 and uh, um, uh, lack of, uh, lack of a, a vision of a path for, for humans uh, for mm -hmm. the future. Uh, what is it mm -hmm. that you would like to communicate to screenwriters or even to shout to them with your knowledge? Okay. Um, I hope that this idea of viewing stories as a means of mass communication, which I believe was not novel to you. You've always known this, but hopefully the, the perspective that I bring to this of thinking of the audience as their brains kind of ticking together as you, bringing them into resonance and creating a shared meaning among them that was not there before you've told them your story. For example, with Atik's uh, Stone of Patient, uh, Pat Patient Stone, um, or other things. So stories have are very effective vehicles of mass communication and they create something that is shared. And with with great power comes great responsibility. And as you said, with the, with the gun culture or so, um, there are many risky behaviors, broadly speaking, that are depicted in movies and very negative behaviors that are modeled And I personally take away most when the, when the, from, from movies uh, that inspire, that focus more on the positive side, right? There is in psychology, we often say bad is stronger than good. Like it's, you know, in the news, you can always see um, how, 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 how these things are often very much reported. So what I hope is that, that, and this is aside from my, from my scientific um, role, It's just a very personal hope um, that I see very um, great potential actually for screenwriter writers to focus on topics that are currently just shockingly lacking, such as, for example, global global perspectives on the world's common problems. So this this idea that um, um, things like overcoming like like little nationalism and things like that i think there are all really great opportunities for uh, for screenwriters which they of course need to embrace given the whole incentive structure of the system right with 
Netflix, Hollywood, and other, and often, often there are even national agendas. I believe in, let's say, Brazil or Indian film industry. I'm not really an industry guy, but I, I think it's the funding will often incentivize such things. Whereas I hope that really um, people can have a vision for these topics that affect everybody, and that also then bring the uh, humanity together. And I believe that this example of this, this I believe stories from the 50s, which was so successful, um, is quite a good example. So I, I would like to see more movies of that kind. But of course, there is kind of a feedback loop with the audience and the money. Um, probably, which which needs to somehow creatively solve solved by you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, before we ask uh, our friends to ask you questions, uh, I can't resist for a last question because I know it is a subject that you've been studying also. Mm -hmm. um, when uh, we work with uh, uh, when we write scripts, the idea is to try to create a ride, a path, a river into which mm -hmm. other humans are going to be taken, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. We are dreaming of making them take off. Um, mm -hmm. How that takeoff works, of course, it's, it's a secret that we want to, we want to, to touch that type of uh, uh, notion with our fingers in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And it has to do with our own ability to take off ourselves as screenwriters when we mm -hmm. write. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we have been collaborating recently with people doing research on hypnosis, mm -hmm. we've been stuck by the common elements between mm -hmm. that river created inside the brain of somebody hypnot hypnotized and what mm -hmm. that type of path or river or, or you know, deep absorption, like we were saying, mm -hmm. that we are mm -hmm. uh, uh, trying to generate mm -hmm. as a screenwriter. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there a pattern inside the human uh, uh, brain or body or uh, mm -hmm. a psychological structure that allows that takeoff and that makes it, in a way, the same kind of experience or is it completely different? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that is a... Great question. And in fact, your earlier question, I already wanted to go into that into that direction when you were asking me about my personal visions. And um, so the, you were alluding to the river and I very much like this metaphor. And there in, in you, you surely know this um, William James, famous psychologist, for example, philosopher, talked about the stream of consciousness and um, Movies, they can um, very powerfully modulate attention. And I see there, there I see the commonality um, with hypnosis very strongly. Um, because in hypnosis, um, it's really all about bringing about attentional focus um, by means of communication, like the hypnotist talking to the um, person who's being hypnotized. Now, I should say, within neuroscience, hypnosis has always had a difficult standing because it's sometimes seen as a little esoteric. And I mean, parts possibly are. Um, but also, there have been really prominent figures within academic psychology and neuroscience, such as Ernest Hilgard, who have um, done a lot of um, deep research on exactly this ability of hypnosis to bring about a very powerful attentional focus. So, for example, many people who can't get, um, how do you call it, anesthesia, right? Um, they use hypnosis for pain modulation. Um, or even hypnosis always has kind of its high times um, during war periods when people are running out of uh, analgesic, analgesics and then um, they have to perform um, operations while people are being hypnotized. So this ability of hypnosis to really very, very strongly focus attention is very very central to um to it now historically most of the hypnosis research has kind of followed a very traditional model saying something like you will not feel any pain and there is not much storytelling about this however the more um 
modern form of hypnosis, they work more indirectly. They work by telling people stories, stories that are deeply absorbing. And this all makes um, use of, atten of the idea that attention is a very limited capacity. Um, so you have only so much of it. And once it's consumed, you cannot use it elsewhere. So for example, while you are sitting on your chair, you probably haven't thought about the way how your feet touch the ground right now, right? Or how your notebook touches your knee. Um, but now that I'm mentioning it, attention goes there. And at that moment, you don't have attention for something else. So with hypnosis, it's really about this idea to create this dance of the mind, so to speak, um, that brings people into a, a state. So I see absolute commonality here by um, hypnosis and the phenomenon of hypnosis that is then this feeling of deep absorption which is an experiential phenomenon and now in neuroscience it's always as i said because of the leibniz problem it's hard for me to to kind of map this feeling and this experience onto the brain region right this is just it's two sides of the same coin so there, there is nothing experience about when you are inside the brain um but definitely, I would argue that it is a common neural signature um, across many people who are in a deeply engaged attentional state. Now, the one thing perhaps is attention is not, not a thing that happens in one particular brain region. But um, we're still trying to figure out how exactly attention is deployed by the brain. But people are now training um, attentional signatures in order. To, and also what I showed you earlier about this collective brain engagement that could also be seen as a signature of collective attention. And I think that this must be common to many people. Otherwise, it would not be possible. It's just as it's just as possible like a like a arm or a knee. So we have similar mechanisms for attention deployment. And it's just about us to engage in discussion in order to figure out how to really decipher it, how to bring it about effectively. So, Ralph, uh, let me introduce you to here Ralitza Petrova from Bulgaria. Uh, uh, Mathieu here, uh, French and American in the same body, <laughs> uh, working as a screenwriter slash editor. Uh, and uh, Christelle here as a screenwriter. Uh, and Pierre here, so Christelle is French, and Pierre here from the UK, uh, and who's a screenwriter also. Has been a producer, has been many things, but now working mostly as a screenwriter. Um, Pleasure to meet you, everyone. So who feels like starting with a question? <clears throat> Christelle, c'est parti. Okay. Um, I am very interested by, in my work, actually, by the um, origin of the stories, you know, mm -hmm. because I think we are our first spectator. Mm -hmm. And uh, in another uh, part of neuro neuroscience, actually, there are researchers who are working on stories we are created during a cognitive trip. Mm -hmm. Those stories uh, are struggle with warriors, dance, mm -hmm. songs, flights, landscapes. And we are in, an, in, an, in a situation or oh, we are uh, in a speech healing, but uh, more tha than that, a spectator. You know? And I I want to know, perhaps you don't know, it, I think it's mm -hmm. uh, uh, perhaps the, the answer you, you did to, to Antoine about hypnotic. Mm -hmm. uh, it, is a, a, it is working for neuroscience. I, I want to know if we are some um, schemas or something about that. Uh, the, the, the connection uh, inside the brain uh, between the uh, creator of the story mm -hmm. and uh, 
her is situation of um, of spectator. Mm -hmm. I'm I don't really know the answer, but I can tell what I know, and, per, and perhaps it's is useful. Perhaps um, I, in a way. The, the perhaps what is perhaps helpful so i i study mostly the audience i but as i have studied the audience i became more interested in what you just said namely the question of whether the person who came up with the story is like the audience because you are when yes. you're creating you are like an audience of one and i always say this to students who are often students often are fraught with anxieties about being negatively evaluated or something and that can stymie, stymie creativity so i always say i create for an audience of one you <laughs> do your own creation and later on let them evaluate it so you don't want to over censor it um, because censorship um, can can be bad but also it sharpens the style during creation right so so somehow you have to a little bit simulate how it's going to affect others and the only person you have at hand to simulate that is you so the so i i this is not a, an answer that will help you um really to to address the question now now the, the perhaps i can refer to the answer that i've previously given to atik um where people were scanned their brains were scanned while they were um thinking about something or tell, uh, telling a story and then they were compared to people whose brain was scanned while they were receiving that story and there are indeed similarities between those and um i would like to focus on this much more but the neuroscience business is just um, at where things stand currently. What I've shown you with the 600 people's brains, this looked like something I could present in two, day, uh, in two minutes. However, collecting these data um, took four years and me analyzing them took another a couple of years. So currently these are decades that one, one, those, one of those studies took. Um, but it's definitely something that is on my agenda um, to examine, for example, the brain activity of a person coming up with a story while they come up with a story, later on perhaps while they refine it, when they already know how things are going to, to, to happen next. This is something we did not really talk about much, but from the neuroscience side of it, um, that is probably the, the big thing where those rewards come, come in from the science side is this idea of prediction and anticipation of the next events which has to do with how the how how much um, a story uh, this expectance breaking that uh, Antoine was uh, alluding to and you as the story writer initially you don't know it that that's where creativity strikes right where you have ideas of where it could go and um, then you need to try out which ones are the good ones so so I'll leave it with that it's not a perfect answer but perhaps it's <laughs> no, I would okay. like to do it more you know? Thank you. Thank, thank you. No, it's, it, thank it's you. fine. Thank you. He continue. Who's next? I can go if you like. Yes. Or Pierre, if you like. Pierre, go ahead. Go ahead, Mathieu. <laughs> Mathieu, let's go. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, um, it's very reassuring in a way to know that all our brains react similarly. It's also a bit scary if uh, I imagine that uh, Hollywood would come to you with uh, artificial intelligence and a lot of money yeah. <laughs> and to produce an algorithm for this. I was, ju I was just wondering um, if, um, if, if it falls in the Leibniz gap, the idea of satisfaction of the audience. Not not reactions to stimuli or peaks of intensity or suspense or anticipation mm -hmm. or tension in general, but the mm -hmm. idea of, of seeing a film as a whole and being satisfied. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily I like it or not. I will recommend this mm -hmm. film to someone or not, but mm -hmm. as a satisfactory experience. Can, is there any way to mm -hmm. record it or to measure it or to understand it? Mm -hmm. Cool. Great. Thank you very much. So, so first of all, I think I can... 
I can, I hopefully can give you kind of, kind of diffuse your worries. And I get these worries a lot that people think about uh, pre-programmed cinema that is kind of automatically um, uh, created. I think that already happens, as you know, with um, um, ha already happens on streaming yeah. platforms. Um, so, okay. but it happens without, it happens without neuroscience. And so I am, I am, I'm not going to say that I, I, will, I will, who knows what life has in for me, but I'm currently trying, if, if I'm trying to use these things, we're trying to use them, if anything, to make health messages more effective, like effective smoking prevention messages. This is something that we've been, been working in. So not, not selling out to the tobacco industry yet. Yeah. Um, so, uh, um, this is part one now, um, the part two about the satisfaction, great question. Um, yes, to the extent that experiential phenomena happen in the brain, which my philosophy says they, they do, um, there is a correlate of this. Um, and something I'm not sure whether you would call immediate pleasure responses as, um, as, as um, satisfying. So I think, for example, if you show kind of positive positive landscape scenery or something that in and of itself creates a little um positive stimuli stimulation in you that you find effectively pleasing but this is probably not the type of satisfaction that you allude to rather what you probably mean is this more kind of cognitive stimulation kind of a long-term satisfaction that the movie told you something meaningful I'm I'm not sure how popular this concept is in in narratology, but in in music theory, at least in German music theory, there is a distinction between E and U, which means Ernst and Unterhaltung. Um, that 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 stands for serious music or entertaining music. And I believe what you mean with satisfaction might have to do more with um, that you were cognitively stimulated such that you appreciate a movie in the week to go or so. And we have started to zoom in on these phenomena, although anything we have done yet, I have I've said this a couple of times now, we have barely scratched the surface of what is possible because this endeavor is really just, um, there are only a number of few people who have done this, but we, we really started to ask them via survey a week later after people had seen a movie to ask them whether how much um, they how often they had thoughts about that movie pop up in their daily lives basically how often they thought wow this is reminding for example somebody once told me um this scene from this hollywood it's a hollywood movie love actually where this guy who is terribly in love um, is in front of the door of a young woman that he is in love with, and then he shows her this, um, these cards and so on. This scene popped up in some person's head repeatedly and gave them a very so. So it was it told them something very meaningful. And what we are trying to do is to basically, when we have these moments of what people recall about a movie later on and find find so stimulating or satisfying. Um, to link that back to the brain activity that happened in those people's brains while they saw it. Yeah. And typically we, we are trying to go for moments of deeper absorption and stronger attentional enhancement. Um, these are tend also to be the ones that are brought up more often. And in fact, there is a very tight link scientifically between attention and memory formation, which is why, for example, people in education, they, a boring lecture that won't leave much traces, right? Whereas if you really get people, um, they will also store it. So it's it's not perfect as an answer for this feeling of satisfaction, but we're definitely trying to connect our neural data captured during recording to the long-term outcomes of what traces this movie leaves in people's lives. Although again, we're just scratching the surface here. Yeah. Thank you. Alita? Uh, hi. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Perfect. Oh, okay. Um, 
Hi, Ralph. Um, well, I can't see you, but it's been fascinating listening to you. And um, um, yeah, I have many, many questions, so it's hard to pick one. Um, I just wanted to ask you to uh, to reflect on, on, is there any studies being made on intuition um, in relation to collective memory? Also in terms of like, um, well, I'm interested from the point of view of, write, of writers and writing, uh, that sense of like, where, where is intuition? Uh, I, I, I guess it's related to the experience and the experiential sort of phenomena that you can mm -hmm. measure. And you've talked about that, but uh, uh, is there any studies in sort of, is there any way to, to measure intuition both as a kind of generating content, but also in terms of tapping into a, the intuition of, a, of an audience, which is to do maybe mm -hmm. with collective memory. So I, I just was interested in that relation between mm -hmm. intuition and collective memory. Yes, um, thank you very much. The, um, as you correctly point out, the topic of intuition is more heavily studied on the side of the authors coming up with things. Um, like or the screenwriters. So this the creative process and you see these topics of intuition and creativity, they are intimately interwoven. And um, there is a branch of psychology that focuses more on this particular with the with respect to the generation of of content. However, and I have not mentioned in this enough um, yet is intuition is it's hard to define intuition in a really clear cut way. That's, that's perhaps the biggest problem. And as a scientist, you're always held to very rigorously defined concepts, which I have not done always today. Um, but so for me, the cool, the interesting thing about intuition is you might be familiar with uh, the idea that or intuition is often kind of demarcated from rational thought, right? It's often said there is kind of this deliberative thought and intuitive thought. Now, this I don't like this very much because it makes it sound as if intuition were illogical. And I don't think it is. It's not at all. But it is um, rather what intuition does is it it draws on vast spaces of knowledge it taps into vast spaces of knowledge that you don't know you have for example and it's partly decoupled from language which makes it so hard to talk about for example while i am right now talking i have no idea how my brain does it to control every single minute muscle in order to address my lips and my tongue and so on that all is intuitive also in in, in the science of memory, there is, for example, people talk about procedural memory, right? How you talk, how you do a surf in tennis and things like this. You, words can barely describe this, but these are knowledge structures that exist that are often motor knowledge, or they could be knowledge that you somehow have, but you don't know you have it. Um, Right. Um, for example, um, there is this famous, famous um, rule ruling, I think, by some Supreme Court of the US or something, when they were asked to kind of rigorously define the demarcation line between between um, porn and art. And then the, the judge came up and he said, you know it when you see it. Right. So in the end of the day, I find that very ironic and very fascinating because in the end of the day, the law uh, lawyers who always are very proud of being so logical and so verbal in the end of the day they just resort to intuition in order to describe something and create a ruling about something they cannot um, really say so clearly i think there is and this is where the where the connection is to collective memory i believe and um in ai because um we were earlier alluding to ai um there is a big, the big problem of current AI is that of what's called common sense. It's all these little things that you know, but you don't know them, right? So for example, computers, they can do a lot of things these days very quickly, very logically, but what they totally lack is social common sense. Um, so they, they don't have any, any idea of all. And all of the social common sense of how we 
non-verbally interact with each other, how we frown with eyes and how we um, do some twinks and body body language. All of this is these are vast knowledge structures that we access intuitively and that are collectively shared across many people. And um, also ideas of the, the good and the bad and so on. They are hard to verbally describe, but intuitively we all immediately know when you when you talk about this or when you talk about a hero or a villain, everybody knows what that is, right? Very quickly. So yeah. I, this is perhaps where the, 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 the great art happens when you are able to play this piano of the this almost this keyboard of the mind, so to speak, with emotions and memories that are largely intuitively accessible. And um, when you do this well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Ralph. Uh, thank you very much. It was very uh, interesting, this exchange. And it, it's really interesting that, you know, between people like us that play with, as you say, intuition, mostly, mm -hmm. and, and, um, and the frame of what science uh, is, is establishing, uh, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's really interesting to cross that border and to, for, for us, use mm -hmm. what you, uh, how you, uh, how you elaborate uh, 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 stable for ground from, uh, in connection with our very unstable ground. <laughs> yeah. No, no, uh, the opposite is true. I've always thought that the great artists understand much more about human psychology than the academic psychologists do. Yeah. Um, so um, I, and I also, as you know, for example, in AI and in people are are using Google Books with thousands of narratives created in order to try to um, assess this common knowledge that has been built and made made accessible by um, by storytellers. Currently, I think I'm more on the receiving end, so it has been my pleasure um, to. I think I've, I've, I'm receiving more from from uh, storytellers than I'm currently giving back. But I hope that that might change, and I hope that I could show you at least at least in terms of the methodology of how we're trying to do this. Yeah. yeah. So we can we can't wait to be to to continue this uh, exchange Ralph, in the future. Uh, I would love to. Thank you very much. Let's continue to talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.